here we go. Nuthanger Farm. When Robert came to Nottingham, sternly without lame, he prayed to God and mild Mary to bring him out safe again. Beside him stood a great headed monk. I pray to God, who he be? For full soon he knew good Robin, as soon as he him see. Robin Hood and the Monk, Child's Ballads, number 119. Hazel sat on the bank in the midsummer night. There had been no more than five hours darkness and that of a pallid twilight quality which kept him wakeful and restless. Everything was going well. Cahar had found Holly during the afternoon and corrected his line a little to the west. He had left him in the shelter of a thick hedge, sure of his course for the Big Warren. It seemed certain now that two days would be enough for the journey. Bigwig and some of the other rabbits had already begun enlarging their burrows in preparation for Holly's return. Cahar had had a violent quarrel with a kestrel, screaming insults in a voice fit to startle a Cornish harbor. And although it had ended inconclusively, the kestrel seemed likely to regard the neighborhood of the hangar with healthy respect for the future. Things had not looked better since they had first set out from Sandalford. A spirit of happy mischief entered into Hazel. He felt as he had on the morning when they crossed the Enborn, and he had set out alone and found the bean field. He was confident and ready for adventure. But what adventure? Something worth telling to Holly and Silver on their return. Something to, well, not to diminish what they were going to do. No, of course not. But just to show them that their chief rabbit was up to anything that they were up to. He thought it over as he hopped down the bank and sniffed out a patch of salad burnet in the grass. What now would be likely to give them just a little, not unpleasant shock? Suddenly he thought, suppose when they got back, that there were one or two does here already. And in that same moment, he remembered what Kehar had said about a box full of rabbits at the farm. What sort of rabbits could they be? Did they ever come out of their box? Had they ever seen a wild rabbit? Kehar had said that the farm was not far from the foot of the down on a little hill, so it could easily be reached in the early morning before its men were about. Any dogs would probably be chained, but the cats would be loose. A rabbit could outrun a cat as long as he kept in the open and saw it coming first. The important thing was not to be stalked unawares. He should be able to move along the hedgerows without attracting a leal, unless he was very unlucky. My dog needs to be let in. But what did he intend to do, exactly? Why was he going to the farm? Hazel finished the last of the burden and answered himself in the starlight. I'll just have a look round, he said. And if I can find those box rabbits, I'll try to talk to them. Nothing more than that. I'm not going to take any risks. Well, not real risks. Not until I see whether it's worth it anyway. Should he go alone? It would be safer and more pleasant to take a companion, but not more than one. They must not attract attention. Who would be best? Bigwig? Dandelion? Hazel rejected them. He needed someone who would do as he was told and not start having ideas of his own. At once, he thought of Pipkin. Pipkin would follow him without question and do anything he asked. At this moment, he was probably asleep in the burrow, which he shared with Bluebell and Acorn, down a short run leading off the honeycomb. Hazel was lucky. He found Pipkin close to the mouth of the burrow and already awake. He brought him out without disturbing the other two rabbits and led him up by the run that gave on the bank. Pipkin looked about him uncertainly, bewildered and half expecting some danger. It's all right, Lelo Roo, said Hazel. There's nothing to be afraid of. I want you to come down the hill and help me find a farm I've heard about. We're just going to have a look round it. Round a farm, Hazel Ra? What for? Won't it be dangerous? Cats and dogs and... No, you'll be quite all right with me. Just you and me. I don't want anyone else. I've got a secret plan. You mustn't tell the others for the time being anyway. I particularly want you to come, and no one else will do. This had exactly the effect that Hazel intended. Pipkin needed no further persuasion, and they set off together. Oh, would you like to join me? No, I need you to tell me if my, if my potato is close to being done or not. In a little bit. I'll come let you know. Can you come check the time on the toaster? It's like she can't see that I'm doing something. <clears throat> I'm 
I already <laughs> checked it a minute ago. Across uh, the turf beyond and down the escarpment, they went through the narrow belt of trees and came into the field where Holly had called Bigwig in the dark. Here Hazel paused, sniffing and listening. It was the time before dawn when owls return, usually hunting as they go. Although a full-grown rabbit is not really in danger from owls, there are few who take no account of them. Stoats and foxes might be abroad also, but the night was still and damp, and Hazel, secure in his mood of gay confidence, felt sure that he would either smell or hear any hunter on four feet. Whatever the farm might be, it must lie beyond the road that ran along the opposite edge of the field. He set off at an easy pace, with Pipkin close behind, moving quietly in and out of the hedgerow up which Holly and Bluebell had come, and passing on their way, under the cables humming faintly in the darkness above, they took only a few minutes to reach the road. There are times when we know for a certainty that all is well. A batsman who has played a fine inning will say afterward that he felt he could not miss the ball, and a speaker or an actor on his lucky day can sense his audience carrying him as though he were swimming in miraculous buoyant water. Hazel had this feeling now. All round him was the quiet summer night, luminous with starlight but paling to dawn on one side. There was nothing to fear, and he felt ready to skip through a thousand farmyards one after the other. As he sat with Pipkin on the bank above the tar-smelling road, it did not strike him as particularly lucky when he saw a young rat scuttle across from the opposite hedge and disappear into a clump of fading stitchwort below them. He had known that some guide or other would turn up. He scrambled quickly down the bank and found the rat nosing in the ditch. "'The farm,' said Hazel. "'Where's the farm? Near here, on a little hill?' The rat stared at him with twitching whiskers. It had no particular reason to be friendly, but there was something in Hazel's look that made a civil answer natural. Over road, up lane. The sky was growing lighter each moment. Hazel crossed the road without waiting for Pipkin, who caught him up under the hedge bordering the near side of the little lane. From here, after another listening pause, they began to make their way up the slope toward the northern skyline. Nuthanger is like a farm in an old tale. Between Etchen's Well and the foot of Watership Down, and about half a mile from each, there is a broad knoll, steeper on the north side but falling gently on the south, like the down ridge itself. Narrow lanes climb both slopes and come together in a great ring of elm trees which encircles the flat summit. Any wind, even the lightest, draws from the height of the elms a rushing sound, multifolate and powerful. Within this ring stands the farmhouse, with its barns and outbuildings. The house may be two hundred years old, or it may be older, built of brick with a stone-faced front looking south toward the down. On the east side, in front of the house, a barn stands clear of the ground on straddle stones, and opposite is a cow byre. As Hazel and Pipkin reached the top of the slope, the first light showed clearly the farmyard and the buildings. The birds singing all about them were those to which they had been accustomed in former days. A robin on a low branch twittered a phrase and listened for another that answered him from beyond the farmhouse. A chaffinch gave its little falling song, and further off, high in an elm, a chaff began to call. Hazel stopped and then sat up, the better to scent the air. Powerful smells of straw and cow dung mingled with those of elm leaves, ashes, and cattle feed. Fainter traces came to his nose as the overtones of a bell sounded in a trainer, trained ear. Tobacco, naturally a good deal of cat, and rather less a dog, and then suddenly, and beyond doubt, rabbit. He looked at Pipkin and saw that he, too, had caught it. While these scents reached them, they were also listening. But beyond the light movements of birds and the first buzzing of the flies immediately around them, they could hear nothing but the continual susurration of the trees. Under the northern steep of the down, the air had been still, but here the southerly breeze was magnified by the elms, with their myriads of small fluttering leaves, just as the effect of sunlight on a garden is magnified by dew. The sound coming from the topmost branches disturbed Hazel because it suggested some huge approach, an approach that was never completed, and he and Pipkin remained still for some time, listening tensely to this loud yet meaningless vehemence high overhead. They saw no cat, but near the house stood a flat-roofed dog kennel, they could just glimpse the dog asleep inside, a large, smooth-haired black dog with heads on paws. Hazel could not see a chain, but then, after a moment, he noticed the line of a thin rope that came out through the kennel door and ended in some sort of fastening on the roof. Why a rope, he wondered, and then thought, 
because a restless dog cannot rattle it in the night. The two rabbits began to wander among the outbuildings. At first they took care to remain in cover and continually on the watch for cats, but they saw none and soon grew bolder, crossing open spaces and even stopping to nibble at dandelions in the patches of weeds and rough grass. Guided by scent, Hazel made his way to a low roof shed. The door was half open and he went through it with scarcely a pause at the brick threshold. Immediately opposite the door, on a broad wooden shelf, a kind of platform, stood a wire-fronted hutch. Through the mesh he could see a brown bowl, some green stuff, and the ears of two or three rabbits. As he stared, one of the rabbits came close to the wire, looked out, and saw him. Beside the flat platform on the near side was an upended bale of straw. Hazel jumped lightly on it, and from there to the thick planks, which were old and soft-surfaced, dusty and covered with chaff. Then he turned back to Pipkin, waiting just inside the door. Hello, Rue, he said. There's only one way out of this place. You'll have to keep watch for cats or we may be trapped. Stay at the door, and if you see a cat outside, tell me at once. Right, Hazel Ra, said Pipkin. It's all clear at the moment. Hazel went up to the side of the hutch. The wired front projected over the edge of the shelf so that he could neither reach it nor look in, but there was a knot hole in one of the boards facing him, and on the far side he could see a twitching nose. I am Hazel, Ra, he said. I have come to talk to you. Can you understand me? The answer was in slightly strange, but perfectly intelligible, Lapheim. Yes, we understand you. My name is Boxwood. Where do you come from? From the hills. My friends and I live as we please without men. We eat the grass, lie in the sun, and sleep underground. How many are you? Four. Box and does. Do you ever come out? Yes, sometimes. A child takes us out and puts us in a pin on the grass. I have come to tell you about my warren. We need more rabbits. We want you to run away from the farm and join us. There's a wire door at the back of this hutch, said Boxwood. Come down there. We can talk more easily. The door was made of wire netting on a wooden frame with two leather hinges nailed to the uprights and a hasp and staple fastened with a wire twist. Four rabbits were crowded against the wire, pressing their noses through the mesh. Two, Laurel and Clover, were short-haired black angoras. The others, Boxwood and his doe haystack, were black and white Himalayans. Hazel began to speak about the life of the Downs and the excitement and freedom enjoyed by wild rabbits. In his usual straightforward way, he told about the predicament of his warren in having no does, and how he had come to look for some. But, he said, we don't want to steal your does. All four of you are welcome to join us, bucks and does alike. There's plenty for everyone on the hills. He went on to talk of the evening feed in the sunset and of early morning in the long grass. The hutch rabbit seemed at once bewildered and fascinated. Clover, the angora doe, a strong, active rabbit, was clearly excited by Hazel's description and asked several questions about the warren and the downs. It became plain that they thought their life in the hutch is dull but safe. They had learned a good deal about Elil from some source or other, and seemed sure that few wild rabbits survived for long. Hazel realized that although they were glad to talk to him and welcomed his visit because it brought a little excitement and change into their monotonous life, it was not within their capacity to take a decision and act on it. They did not know how to make up their minds. To him and his companions, sensing and acting was second nature, but these rabbits had never had to act to save their lives or even to find a meal. If he was going to get any of them as far as the down, they would have to be urged. He sat quiet for a little, nibbling a patch of bran spilled on the boards outside the hutch. Then he said, I must go back now to my friends in the hills, but we shall return. We shall come one night, and when we do, believe me, we shall open your hutch as easily as the farmer does, and then any of you who wish will be free to come with us. Boxwood was about to reply when suddenly Pipkin spoke from the floor. Hazel, there's a cat in the yard outside. We're not afraid of cats, said Hazel to Boxwood, as long as we're in the open. Trying to appear unhurried, he went back to the floor by way of the straw bale and crossed over to the door. Pipkin was looking through the hinge. He was plainly frightened. I think it smelled us, Hazel, he said. I'm afraid it knows where we are. Don't stay there, then, said Hazel. Follow me close and run when I do. Without waiting to look out through the hinge, he went round the half-open door of the shed and stopped on the threshold. The cat, a tabby with white chest and paws, was at the further end of the little yard, walking slowly and deliberately along the side of a pile of logs. When Hazel appeared in the doorway, it saw him at once and stood stuck still, with staring eyes and twitching tail. 
Hazel hopped slowly across the threshold and stopped again. Already sunlight was slanting across the yard, and in the stillness the flies buzzed about a patch of dung a few feet away. There was a smell of straw and dust and hawthorn. You look hungry, said Hazel to the cat. Rats getting too clever, I suppose. The cat made no reply. Hazel sat blinking in the sunshine. The cat crouched almost flat on the ground, thrusting its head forward between its front paws. Close behind, Pipkin fidgeted, and Hazel, never taking his eyes from the cat, could sense that he was trembling. Don't be frightened, Lalo Roo, he whispered. I'll get you away, but you must wait till it comes for us. Keep still. The cat began to lash its tail. Its hindquarters lifted and wagged from side to side in mounting excitement. Can you run, said Hazel. I think not. Why, you pop-eyed backdoor saucer scraper. The cat flung itself across the yard and the two rabbits leapt into flight with great thrusts of their hind legs. The cat came very fast indeed and although both of them had been braced ready to move on the instant, they were barely out of the yard in time. Racing up the side of the long barn, they heard the Labrador barking in excitement as it ran to the full extent of its rope. A man's voice shouted to it. From the cover of the hedge beside the lane, they turned and looked back. The cat had stopped short and was licking one paw with a pretense of nonchalance. They hate to look silly, said Hazel. It won't give us any more trouble. If it hadn't charged us like that, it would have followed us much further and probably called up another as well. And somehow you can't make a dash unless they do it first. It's a good thing you saw it coming, Lalo Roo. I'm glad if I helped, Hazel. But what were we up to, and why did you talk to the rabbits in the box? I'll tell you all about it later on. Let's go into the field now and feed. Then we can make our way home as slowly as you like.